to be here and to continue to be a witness and a testimony that, Father, you can do a miracle there. And, Father, we just pray for your will to be done. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen the family, strengthen Brother Cody at this time, and continue to help him to keep his eyes on you. Father, bless our lesson, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's jump right into the lesson. Uh, letter F, we finished up letter E last week, was, which was about the enemy. And now we're going on to letter F, the family, the family, or talking about the Christian home. So here on our pages, it says the Bible teaches that God has established two institutions, the home and the church. Nothing should be more important to a Christian than these two places, for they are sacred. Now, some may argue that there was a third institution that uh, God created, and that would be government, because the Lord did give the Ten Commandments, and He did give laws. Uh, but the point is, is that there are two main institutions that God has ordained or has established, and these two institutions will decide what direction a nation goes. Uh, when you look at the families or the homes in a nation and the churches in that nation, those homes and those churches decide what direction that country goes and how the government uh, governs that nation. And so we need to understand the importance of these two institutions. Nothing, as we said, should be more important than these two because they're sacred. God ordained them. Contrary to what many think, the home and the church are complementary. They work together. The greatest home is one built around a church, and the greatest church is one made up of families who attend faithfully and serve the Lord together. So if you want to have a family that is honoring to God and that is blessed by God, then you need to be in a God-fearing, Bible-preaching and teaching church. And you need to be faithful. This morning I sent out a text message. Many of you probably got it. I'm just encouraging people to be here either at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or both. And I said in there, God is in the process of giving us a building. Let's show Him by our faithfulness that we're worthy of that blessing. Honestly, God is being so gracious to us as a church to open this door to us, and we need to show Him our gratitude by being faithful to Him. And in the process of being faithful to Him, He continues to bless us even more. So you have the home and you have the church, and the two are supposed to work together. It is little wonder, the author writes, then that Satan's arena of diabolic activity is in our homes and in the churches. This is truly an age when many homes and marriages are on the rocks instead of being on the rock. Matthew 7, verse number 24 says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Many homes, many marriages are on the rocks because their marriage is not built on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they are going through trials and tribulations, and they can't find strength to keep their marriage or their home together because they are not built, that marriage is not built on Jesus Christ and on their faith in Jesus Christ. You notice how that in this illustration that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter number seven, that both the rich, uh, excuse me, both the wise man and the foolish man went through this trial. They both went through a time where the winds blew and where the, the, the house was beaten upon by the rain, but one stood and one didn't. In other words, uh, people, saved and unsaved, all go through trials and tribulations. And every marriage, whether it's a Christian marriage or a non-Christian marriage, goes through these trying times. The way to be successful and make sure that your marriage and your home stay together is by making sure that it's built on your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, moving on, the Bible is a very practical book and has much to say about the home. God has a definite blueprint for your family, for your home. If you were to build a home today, 
you were to go buy a lot somewhere here in Atwater and you said, you know what, we want to build ourselves a home. Maybe you want a two-story home. Maybe you want a ranch style home. You would have to get some blueprints, some floor plans, and then you would follow those floor plans at, or those blueprints as you built that home. And that's exactly what the Word of God is for us. It is a blueprint on how we can have a strong marriage and how we can have a successful God-honoring home. Now, this lesson is not going to cover everything that the Bible says about the family or about a Christian home, but it's going to give us some principles that we can follow. So let's look at the first one, the first home. We're going to start back in Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 15, and we're going to read about the very first home, of course, being Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 15. Let's see. There we go. The Bible says here, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an helpmeet for him. Up to this point, from verse number 15 to verse number 20, we see that Adam is busy. God's given him responsibilities. He's already got a job and occupation. That's to make sure that he uh, dresses and keeps the Garden of Eden. And God sees that he needs some fellowship. He needs uh, a companionship. He needs someone to complete him. And there is not a person, there is not a helpmeet for him. So, in verse number 21, the Bible says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So here we read uh, that according to God, it was not good for man to be alone. He saw that Adam was alone, and he knew that this was not a good thing. In verse number 18, the Lord actually spoke these words. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Now, more than likely, this is God the Father talking to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Back in Genesis chapter number 1, we know that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all uh, evidenced and shown in the creation of man. In, in chapter 1, verse number 26, where it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. All right, so God the Father here is saying, you know what? It's not good for him to be alone. So he makes for him a help me. Now we saw here how this first woman was made. She was made out of one of Adam's ribs. In verse number 21, it says that God caused a deep sleep to fall upon him. As Adam was sleeping, he took that rib and then he clothed the flesh, healed it. And from that rib, he made uh, a woman. And because... She was made from Adam's rib. That's why Adam then called her woman, because she's bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. All right, now, he is missing something. He is physically missing something. He's missing a rib. And the only way for him to get that rib back is to be united with her, the creation that was made or the, the creature that was made out of that rib, woman. And so, therefore, the Bible goes on to tell us in verse number 24 that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Remember that word cleave means to be made one, to be united. He's going to cleave to her, and now he has that rib back. He is completed. Without his wife, he is not completed. He is missing something. But with his wife, he is completed. So, in this passage, God says the woman is to be and help meet for the man, for Adam. This means that the woman complements and completes him, as I just mentioned a moment ago. 
In marriage, a man, and I'm sorry, I'm sort of going through these blanks here. I'm not asking the questions. I'm just sort of going through them. So hopefully if you're following along, you're able to fill in the blanks here. But uh, letter D is where I'm at. In marriage, a man, we're told, is to leave his father and his mother in verse number 24 and to cleave unto his wife. He's supposed to leave his parents and he's supposed to cleave to his wife. Now, that's an illustration that he is. It's not that he is no longer their son, but now his obligation is to leave. He is still their child. He is still their son, but now he has become a man. And now he needs to lead. And now he has someone who com is completing him and who is depending upon him. And so he needs to cleave to her and become one with her. There, uh, one of the reasons why many marriages are not lasting anymore is because uh, the husbands and the wives are not cleaving together. And when they get upset at each other, by the way, everybody gets upset at others, and, and they have a difficulty or they have a disagreement, instead of working it out, uh, instead of trying to figure out uh, where they went wrong and how to fix it, they just run back to mama and daddy. Now, there are some times, obviously, where that's necessary, where there's physical abuse involved or, or there's some type of abuse there. But I'm talking about just simple disagreements where people are disagreeing and instead of working it out and cleaving to each other and realizing that when you walk down that aisle and when you take those vows, those vows are supposed to be for life. And there was a day and age in which people thought long and hard about accepting or women thought long and hard about it. Because they knew they were being joined to that man in holy matrimony for life. And now uh, the day and age in which we live, it's so simple to be separated, to get separated, or to get a divorce that really, if you have a conflict, you have a problem, you just go ahead and go down and get it taken care of. And all right, we're, that, that's a, a, a annulled and we're no longer married. And ultimately, the Bible tells us, and Jesus later said that what God had joined together, let no man put asunder. We need to cleave together. A man needs to leave his father and his mother. And then in marriage, a couple becomes one flesh. They become one. They're now, are they going to think alike? Absolutely not. Are they going to do everything alike? We know that never happens. Uh, the husband probably leaves uh, the toilet lit up sometimes and forgets to put the cap back on the toothpaste. Or maybe that's the wife that forgets to put the cap back on the toothpaste. Everybody does things a little bit different. Guys naturally seem to be messy. Uh, we might be organized with some things like our tools, all right, or our, uh, or whatnot, our fishing gear or hunting gear or what whatever you like to do as a hobby. But naturally, it seems like more guys than women are are messy, and women naturally are more tidy. And so that's not going to change with marriage, obviously. So we're not going to be exactly the same, but we should be one flesh with the same desire, which is to love our spouse and to love God first. Going on to the back page there, according to Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 16, why don't you look at that verse if you would. I've got it up here on the overhead for you if you don't have your Bible. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Now this is after Adam and Eve had sinned in the Garden of Eden. Of course, a punishment was handed down to each one of them as well as to the serpent. But notice after the punishment, in verse number 16, at the end, he says, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, Adam was supposed to be a protector. He was supposed to be a, the leader, and he was not. He, when Eve came and offered him some of the fruit, he went ahead and took it and ate of it instead of leading and telling her, No, we're not going to do that or making sure that he protected her so that the serpent couldn't get to her. He was not the protector he needed to be. So God reminded them here of the responsibility that the wife, her desire was going to be to her husband and that he was going to rule over thee. Now that's not in the caveman sense. That's not in the Neanderthal sense. We're talking about ruling as far as uh, leading and he's supposed to protect. Uh, moving on, Matthew chapter number 19 and verses uh, four through six, the Lord Jesus talked about the permanency of the marriage relationship. And I just mentioned this a few moments ago. Now that what God hath 
joined together, let no man put asunder. In Matthew chapter number 19 and verse number 4, the Bible says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And then he talks about the permanency, how it's supposed to be a permanent thing, the marriage is. Verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Excuse me, I have this verse up here for you so you can see it. Let not man put asunder. So he says, if God's joined you two together, then don't let man divide you. And don't let man separate you. Ultimately, that's one of the things when I do counsel with couples, I ask him, I said, are you convinced, do you have peace that you are to marry one another? Can you tell me that you have no doubts whatsoever that this is what God wants you to do? Because if you walk down an aisle and you say, I do, and you say, I know God wants this, then you need to work it out and you need to stay together. Don't let man divide you. Don't let man pull you apart. But once again, it all goes back to that marriage relationship, starting with the Lord Jesus Christ and being built on the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter number 7, verses 1 through 3. God's plan for marriage was only to be broken by one thing, that permanency of marriage. In Romans chapter number 7, we see that Paul writes, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. And it says there in that third verse then, So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So verse number 10 said that that bond of marriage was to be broken only by death. Notice here in verse number 2, once again it says that she is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. In other words, that marriage relationship is no longer existent because he has gone on to glory. And so it's not wrong for her to remarry. So the Bible teaches that it's supposed to be permanent and that only death is supposed to uh, end that bond of marriage. Then over in Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 4. Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 4. The Bible says there, Marriage is honorable, excuse me, in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So marriage is an honorable thing. And it says that it's honorable in all. In every aspect, marriage is an honorable thing. And for that reason, the bed is supposed to be undefiled. In other words, a husband is supposed to keep himself for his wife and a wife for her husband. And they are supposed to be, once again, that one flesh. Uh, you'll notice here that in parentheses, the author of the curriculum wrote, that uh, premarital chastity is important as well. That before they become united in holy matrimony, they need to make sure that they keep themselves pure, uh, not only uh, for each other, but uh, until that uh, until that uh, marriage ceremony for each other. Uh, they need to stay undefiled, make sure that they're not participating in things that are wrong. Why? Because marriage is an honorable thing. And remember that in the Old Testament, there were many pictures or illustrations of things that were to come in the New Testament or that were to come in the future, uh, What uh, period. And remember that marriage is a picture of what's going to happen one day. As we who are Christians, we who are believers, are going to be presented by God the Father, to God the Son, He is going to be the bridegroom, and we are the bride, and we're going to be made one with Him, the one who died for our sins. And so this is a picture of our relationship with God and how that we're supposed to be united 
with His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer, and then let me encourage you, take these lessons home and, and read over them this week. Work on them a little bit on your own, and then we'll try to finish up this lesson next Sunday morning. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand how important it is that we who are married, that we stay faithful to you first and to our spouse second. Father, I pray, Lord, for those that are still waiting for that uh, time when you bring to them the one that you have for them. Father, I pray that you'd help them to, to stay close to you. And Father, that they would join themselves with someone who believes the way that they do, that believes the Word of God and has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for our young people in our teen group and even in our junior department. Father, even now, if